All right, everyone, welcome back. This is going to be a much shorter unit. However, it's entirely concepts based. All right. So what we were doing in the previous video about all the basic derivative rules, uh, remember calculus builds on itself, math builds on itself. Everything we did in the previous video was essentially your introduction, your prerequisite knowledge, the knowledge that you need to have memorized and committed to second nature in order for you to perform well in this unit and the next unit. After that, I think we start in the rules. Anyway, so these are some of the more complex forms of differentiation. Among these is implicit differentiation, which is uh, the most common standalone FRQ on the BC exam by far. So if you were to pay attention to anything in this video, you're going to pay attention when I start talking about implicit. The other uh, stuff I'm covering in this video is still extremely important. It's still going to be component parts of other FRQs or standalone multiple choice questions. So the stuff in this uh, video is a big deal. It's all conceptual. There's very little memorization. Okay, so our first topic is going to be composite functions. Composite functions. Now what that means, what a composite function is, is it is a function that is comprised of multiple interrelated functions. Now, let me give you an example of what exactly I mean by that. Let's say we're given a function h of x, and h of x equals f of g of x. Okay, so it's got one nested inside the other. An example of that would be uh, h of x equals cosine of x squared. Notice how that's different from cosine of x all squared. These are not the same. Anyway, so we're dealing with h of x equals cosine of x squared. Now given this general formula, how about we try and break down this function? Pause the video right now and see if you can identify what f of x is and what the g of x is. Okay, f of x is cosine x. All right, pretty simple. f of x is not cosine x squared. Cosine x squared is f of g of x, such that g of x equals x squared. Okay, so how do we differentiate a function like that? It's not multiplication, division, constant multiple, or anything we've learned before. Well, now we introduce a new rule for a new type of function, okay? We call this the chain rule. Again, you don't need to memorize the names. You just need to know what to use and when to apply it. The chain rule states that given h of x equals f of g of x, h prime of x, I've got special markers that you need to pump up every time you use them. So h prime of x would equal f prime of g of x times g prime of x, okay? Notice how the original function f of x has no place in this rule, okay? We're do only dealing with f prime of x, g prime of x, and the original function g of x, all right? So when we look at this formula, okay, let's find the derivative of f of x. And if you practiced last uh, video's material like I hoped you did on Khan Academy, this is like second nature to you, equals negative sine x. Derivative of this guy, obviously, 2x. Okay, so let's use these to plug into our equation right here. Our formula, I should say, equals f prime of g of x. f prime is negative sine of g of x, g of x is x squared, times g prime of x, which is 2x. And that would be your answer. Okay? To put it into words, the derivative of a composite function with 
this form is the derivative of the outside, where cosine would be the outside, evaluated on the inside, multiplied by the derivative of the outside. If you identify f of x as the outside of the composite function and x squared as the inside of the composite function, then it can be stated that the derivative of a composite function is the derivative of the outside function, negative sine, evaluated on the inside function, x squared, the inside function doesn't change, multiplied by the derivative of the inside function, 2x. Okay. Now, that is not the only form of a composite function. You could have h of x equals f of g of j of x. You could have something with more than one layer. You could have something with 40 layers. So let's show you how to deal with that. Okay. So the, there's no new rule. The same rule still applies. It just needs to be used more than once. Okay, so let me show you what I mean by that. Let's try and use the rule right now, okay? Let's find what our outside is. Our outside is f of x. That's our outside. And let's find what our inside is. Our inside is g of j of x. That's our inside. Okay? So if we were to say we want to take the outside the derivative of the outside evaluated on the inside, we would get h prime x equals f prime derivative of the outside evaluated on the inside g of j of x times the derivative of the inside. Oh wait! I'm trying to take the derivative of the inside. I'm trying to take the derivative of a composite function. So now I need to do the rule again. Now g of j of x becomes my outside, and j of x becomes my inside. Okay? So let's refer back to the rule. It's the derivative of the outside, g prime, evaluated on the inside, j of x, multiplied by the derivative of the inside, j prime. What? Multiplied by the derivative of the inside, j prime of x. Okay? So it's multi-layered. What we're doing here is we're effectively peeling back the layers one by one. Notice how the inside stays constant. First we did f prime, then we did g prime, then we did j prime. Okay? So let's do this with a real function for us to get a bit of practice. So let me give you h of x equals the natural log of 3x squared. Okay? We can identify an f of x, we can identify an outside. Your outside function is your natural log of x. We can identify an inside, which is your 3x squared, and we just follow the rule. It becomes the derivative of the outside f prime of x, remember, derivative of ln x is 1 over, evaluated on the inside, 3x squared, times the derivative of the inside, which is 6x. And that would equal your h prime x. Boom, bam, bop. Same principle would also apply if I gave you a three-layered or two-layered 
a function, h of x equals a cosine of the natural log of 3x squared. Now this just becomes h prime x equals a negative sine of ln of 3x squared times 1 over 3x squared times 6x. Okay, makes sense, I hope so, because um, you're going to need to go to Khan Academy and you're going to need to practice a bit, because obviously you don't have this down to second nature yet. Moving on, we have what I would consider to be um, the most like out there and sort of irrelevant and or like why is this here kind of topic. It's a very short topic. It will only ever be a maximum of one multiple choice on the exam. It'll never be an FRQ. But if you're someone like me and you still want to get that one multiple choice right, if you can, then stick along. This is called inverse differentiation. Okay. So say I am given to you a function f of x, okay, and I tell you to find the derivative of f inverse of x at a certain point. Let's call this a, okay? Um, there is a method where you could find f inverse of a if you know f prime of a. Oh, shit. Nope. Nope. Cut. Inverse differentiation. Let's say I give you a function f of x. That function has an inverse, f inverse x. Okay? Let's say I'm evaluating the inverse of x at a point. Let's call that point A. Inverse differentiation teaches you a method, simple formula, where you'd be able to find f prime inverse of A, means the derivative of the inverse of f of x at A, if you were given f prime of of f of a. It's, it's the most confusing topic in Calc BC for me. Okay. Now, what's this basically telling you is if I have a function f of x and I know the derivative of f of x, f, if I know f prime of x, how can I find f prime inverse of x. All right, well, the simple answer to that is if you know f of x, if you know f of x equals uh, cosine x, then you can just find the inverse by hand. You can find f inverse of x equals uh, cosine inverse of x, and then you can just take the derivative of this, right? But on that one question I'm talking about on the AP exam, they're not going to give you a function. They're going to give you a table of values. They're going to give you a table of values for f of x and x, and they're going to give you a table of values for f prime of x and x. And then they're going to ask you for f prime inverse. No, that's not how you write f prime inverse. <laughs> They're going to ask you for f prime inverse of x, right? The formula is if I'm looking for the inverse derivative of uh, f of f of x, 
this is the formula, that equals 1 over the derivative of f of x, okay? Notice what's inside the function bars here. 1 has an, 1 is an, is evaluated at f of x, and 1's evaluated at just x, all right? Just a formula you're going to need to memorize. And you just take values from the tables they give you, and you plug them into that. Okay, and that's how you get your answer. Sometimes, if you're lucky, the one question that they give you on this topic is they do indeed give you the function, and then you can just take the inverse of it and evaluate that derivative, and you don't have to worry about any of this, but it's still good to be prepared. Anyway, on to arguably the most important topic in all of derivatives, implicit differentiation. Okay, so there are some functions, there are some graphs that are not capable of being expressed in the form y equals f of x. There are some functions that need to be expressed as a combination of the two. For example, like xy squared plus 2y equals 4x plus 6. Okay? You can't isolate y. You can't get y by itself. It is a function that does not have a single, that might not have a single output for a uh, single input. Okay? If your pre-calc knowledge is still with you, that means a graph like this could fail the vertical line test. Therefore, it's not a function. But we're still going to need to know how to differentiate that. Differentiate means find the derivative if I did not cover that already. Okay. So, before we get into that, I'm going to need to teach you guys a bit more notation. Alright, so we have the notation dy dx. You say it dy dx. It's not dy over dx. You say it dy dx. Alright? If you want to sound all technical, you can read it as the derivative of y with respect to x. dy dx is the same as f prime of x. It's the same as y prime of x. It just means the derivative. Okay? Instead of saying h prime of x here, I could have replaced this with dy dx. It's just another way of writing the derivative. However, this one, dy dx, I like a bit more, because let's say if I wanted to find f prime of a, the way you would write that here is dy dx with a vertical bar, a at the bottom. It's a lot neater. So if I wanted to find dy dx at f of a, it would look a lot neater, instead of this mess you see right here. This mess you could rewrite as dy dx inverse evaluated at f of x. And that looks a lot neater than that does. Anyway, this is just a new form of representing the derivative, okay? However, since this is not a function, this notation does not apply to this. dy dx is the only notation that applies to this, okay? So you can use dy dx everywhere. You can't use f prime of x everywhere. dy dx is the only derivative notation you can use when you find the derivative of an implicitly defined function. That's what you call a function like this, an implicitly defined function. Okay, so there is a new rule that you must learn now, that you've been doing inadvertently all along, but now we need to formally define it, okay? When you came across the function, let's say y equals x squared, what you were doing is you were, in fact, taking the derivative of both sides this entire time, okay? 
you took the derivative of the right side, and you know that's 2x, and you took the derivative of the left side. The derivative of the left side, the derivative of y, is dy dx. If you were given f of x equals x squared, the derivative of the left side is f prime x equals 2x. Okay? So, still a similar topic that you've been seeing through math all, all these years. Whatever you do to the left, you got to do the, to the right. If you take the derivative of the left, you have to take the derivative of the right. So, the derivative of y, the derivative of y is dy dx. Okay? Now, you're going to see uh, chain rule and composite functions play a big role here. Let me demonstrate that. If I gave you y squared equals x squared, okay, we know that the derivative of y is dy dx. But as we've seen before, the derivative of y squared cannot be dy dx squared because that would be a product rule problem. It's y times y. Or it's a chain rule problem where y is the inside and x squared is the outside. You see here, y squared has a y is the inside and x squared is the outside. Therefore, we pull back this rule f prime of g of x times g prime of x. So the derivative of the outside. The derivative of the outside is 2 times the inside y times the inside times the derivative of the inside dy dx. Therefore, the derivative of y squared equals 2y dy dx. Okay? Y's always apply to this chain rule. Any single term of Y will use the chain rule. Y to the third becomes 3y squared dy dx. So, all of that being said, let's try and tackle this monstrosity right here. This, we can see, product rule. x times the derivative of the second function would be what? 2y dy dx. Because it's derivative of the outside, we bring the 2 down, evaluate it on the inside, g of x, the y stays on the inside, times the derivative of the inside, which is dy dx. Now we finish the rest of our product rule, which is y squared times 1. That's that term, plus 2y, derivative of the outside would be 2. Evaluated on the inside. Well, f of x equals 2, there really is no inside, so that stays as a 2. Times the derivative of the inside, which is dy dx. Okay? So that's our left side of the function. Now let's differentiate the right side of the function, which is just 4. Okay? So we get, as a result, x to y, or let me rewrite that as something prettier, 2xy dy dx plus y squared plus 2 dy dx equals 4. Okay? That's our derivative. It's not really useful to us in this form, okay? We want to get dy dx by itself in the same way that we wanted to get 
f prime of x by itself. So now that's the second part of this problem. We're going to need to isolate dy dx. Let's try and get all the dy dx on one side. That seems like a good place to start. Okay, 2x dy dx, that term has a dy dx, let's keep it on this side, dy dx, plus y squared, that term doesn't have a dy dx, so let's move it to the other side, plus 2 dy dx, that's going to stay on this side, equals 4 minus y squared. Now where do we go from here? Uh... We can't divide both sides by 2xy. What we could do is since we have a dy dx in both of these terms, we can factor out a dy dx. And this becomes 2xy plus 2 in parentheses equals 4 minus y squared. Now in our second line of work, we're just going to divide both sides by whatever's in the parentheses. And by that token, we will get dy dx by itself, and we will have on the right side 4 minus y squared divided by 2xy plus 2. And that is your final answer. That is how you do implicit differentiation. Okay? First, you look at the function, you differentiate both sides. It's, yeah, you can boil it down. So, this is pretty much the hardest type of problem that you're going to see with implicit differentiation. Well, the only way they could make this harder is if they included things like cosines and natural logs. And that's not necessarily harder, it's just more time consuming. Because you all know the derivative rules for natural logs and cosines. Anyway, implicit differentiation can be boiled down to four steps. Now, implicit differentiation isn't a long sequence, but look at all this work. There's a lot of room for error here. That's why implicit differentiation is uh, commonly regarded as one of the harder topics, because there's a lot of room to make a mistake. Anyway, the four steps. Step one, differentiate both sides. Simple. You've been doing that a long time. Step two collect all of the dy dx terms on one side of the on one side of the equal sign step 3 factor out a dy dx from all the terms on your one side of the equal sign and step 3 divide by one of those factor products to isolate dy dx your goal is to always have a dy dx And, a little bit of a pro tip, if you have access to your calculator and you're able to plug the function into your calculator to see what it looks like, if the function fails the vertical line test, the function will always have both an x and a y term in the derivative. A little fun fact. Because, if it fails the vertical line test, there's two y points for every x point. Therefore, the derivative is no longer based just on x, you need to tell the derivative function what x point and which of the y points that it needs to take the derivative at. Okay? So this is effectively a derivative that can uh, find tangent lines, find slopes of functions that fail the vertical line test. Now, often in all of the implicit differentiation FRQs, they're going to ask you to take the second derivative, take the derivative of this. Okay? Now, let me introduce to you another notation. So we already discussed that the second derivative can be written as f double prime of x. Second derivative here can be written as, bear with me, d squared y dx squared. That's how you write the second derivative in the dy dx notation. Remember, you have to use the dy dx notation for all implicit differentiation. Okay? When you differentiate this, you will be differentiating y's. 
And if you're differentiating y's, that means you're going to be using the chain rule and you will be getting a dy dx. Okay. The difference now is you're not trying to isolate dy dx anymore. You've already taken the derivative of dy dx, you've already taken the derivative of your left side of the equal sign, and this is the derivative of your left side of the equal sign. Okay? So when you take the derivative of y for a second time, you'll get a dy dx. And you're not going to know which to, what to do with it, because you're not trying to isolate dy dx anymore. What you do with it is, let's say uh, I get a function x squared y dy dx. That's not the actual second derivative, but you use it as an example. I would look at dy dx, and I would substitute this hullabaloo right here, and I would substitute it back into there. So now this would become d squared y dx squared, the second derivative of this guy, would equal x squared y multiplied by all of this, okay? I'm not going to take the time to actually find the second derivative here for you guys because that's probably going to be extra practice for you. I'd like you to, you know, experience it. Also, it's going to take a considerable amount of time and I don't want to waste your time. Anyway, that's implicit differentiation. If you were to study anything for the uh, Calc BC exam, this should be one of your top priorities. Enjoy life.